Thanks, everyone. And uh, we are glad uh, that you can join us today. So, hello, everyone. And today we'll be discussing uh, investigating and reporting uh, far right uh, extremism. My name is Paul Adepoji, and I'm the community manager for the ICFJ Pamela Howard uh, Global Crisis Reporting Forum. And uh, today we are talking about a very serious issue that I think uh, is of global relevance. But I'll provide a quick uh, background for you. So far right extremism has been extensively cited as a major factor in the 2000, 2021 United States Capitol attack that sought to overturn the election of Joe Biden in favor of Donald Trump. And the attack ended uh, with five deaths that day. Uh, about 140 police officers got injured. More than $30 million was uh, spent on repairs and security measures, and there were over 800 criminal charges. And uh, far-right extremism uh, is, of course, not unique uh, to the United States, nor is it new. And uh, the term was actually coined uh, back in the 1950s. But today, uh, it is associated with a political preference that leans towards uh, extreme conservatism and uh, white supremacism. And it's also paired with uh, conspiratorial uh, rhetoric. And according to an article uh, in the Combating Terrorism Center's uh, journal, uh, The Sentinel, uh, far, uh, the right-wing extremists today, in many cases, uh, did no longer subscribe to the narrow concept of nationalism, but instead imagined themselves as participants uh, in a global struggle against a uh, global enemy. Paraphrasing uh, that article, he said, uh, consequently, networking and cooperating across borders is seen as a necessity. And uh, that is according to the author Yasin uh, Mushabash. Uh, Mushabash. And uh, we are hosting uh, Yasin today and uh, for this webinar. And I'd like to say, uh, how are you doing, Yasin? And thanks for joining us today. No problem, and I'm very well. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so at the end of today, we hope our journalists will learn how to investigate the far right with a focus on globalization. And uh, you also know how to plan an investigation and uh, you know what does an ideal team look like and what reporting methods uh, should be used. And you also have an idea of how to navigate the process of data mining, interviews, background meetings, identifying informants, and getting your, uh, them to talk to you, including uh, relying on uh, court proceedings, in addition to keeping yourself safe. And um, so today, I'm really excited that we are having this conversation. And uh, our expert, uh, our, get, our panelists today uh, started working as a journalist while he was still at the university. And from 2004 to 2012, he worked for Spiegel. And in 2012, he started working for D8, uh, which is Germany's uh, largest uh, weekly newspaper, where he has risen to become a deputy head of the investigations department. His area of expertise uh, include jihad and political uh, extremism. So I, you agree with me that we are in the right hands today uh, to navigate this highly delicate, sensitive, critical, but equally important uh, subject. So if you are watching us on Facebook live stream, and uh, we also thank you for joining us today, and uh, you can actively engage with us using the comment box below the video you are watching. And if you are joining us on the Zoom platform, as usual, I'm always interested in knowing where you are joining us from today, so that our speaker can have an idea of which region you are uh, joining us from. So please use the chat box uh, to tell us where you are joining us from and um, we'll be, we are glad that you are able to join us today. And uh, with, without wasting much time, and uh, I would like to hand over the discussion to Yasin and uh, after his uh, brief presentation, I will now come with a question and answers. So how are you doing and um, the floor is yours. <laughs> Sorry? How Yes, I said the floor is yours, and uh, yes, ah. I would like you to start the conversation, okay. and uh, yeah, then I will sure. now engage you, yes. Okay, well, <clears throat> um, maybe I should start by telling you a little bit about, about, I think, about the story that we wrote that, you know, got Paul and Stella interested in, in connecting with me. Um, at the side, we, we have the luxury of being able to publish very long reads. So uh, every week we publish one story that gets three you know, entire newspaper pages of a very large newspaper. So that's a very, very long feature that you can write there. And we at the investigative department of the paper um, quite often um, get to write this particular 
long story. Um, so the story that we wrote about the globalization of the far right was one of those pieces um, that, that was run in that section of our newspaper. Um, and, and the idea that we had um, started, or the idea that we, that we turned into this article started with um, an op-ed that I had read in the New York Times. And in the New York Times, um, a terrorism expert and the US congressman had written um, an article saying that um, they believe that the battlefield in Ukraine had become an international magnet for far-right extremist foreign fighters, and that the problem was already of the same dimension, if not bigger, um, uh, than the problem of jihadists gathering in Afghanistan in the 1980s. So that's what spiked my interest because I'm, you know, I'm really a jihadism expert. That, that's what I've been working on for almost 24, 25 years. And, and I know a lot about, you know, the jihadists gathering in Afghanistan in the 1980s. And I knew what came, you know, from that, namely Al-Qaeda and everything that came after. So, so you know, but after I read this article, I, I kind of thought, is, is this true? Is there so many foreign fighters of the far right um, that went to Ukraine and then networked there and got to know each other and exchanged you know, ideas and training and, and best practices? And if so, that's very concerning. So I convinced um, a, a number of people in our team to enter into this investigation. Um, and so our basic idea was, or our basic question was, is there such a thing as a really tenable, viable, palpable globalization of far-right extremists? And what does it mean? And can we observe it in action? Can we actually identify people in the process of networking? Because we, we wanted, we, we did not want to write, you know, in a purely analytical piece, we wanted to show that this is really happening, if it is happening. Um, so that was our starting point. And we looked at Ukraine and we realized, yes, there is a, a large number of foreign fighters, or there was, at least for a time, namely um, right after 2014. Um, you know, there, there probably were as many as 17,000 foreign fighters um, from all across the world, most of them from Europe. But there were Americans there. Uh, there were people from other parts of the world there. Um, and, and, and after we started looking into that and trying to find stories about and reports about what some of them did after they returned from the battlefield, we started to realize, okay, this is a big problem. Because you know, there were, for example, cases in Italy where returnees from the battlefield in Ukraine had been arrested by the police after they started hoarding massive amounts of explosives. So what did they have in mind? You know, what were they planning to do? And there were other similar cases all across Europe where we suddenly realized, wow, there's, 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 a, there's a bunch of people who had been in Ukraine who have met with other foreign uh, fighters of the far right and then returned to their home countries and apparently started plotting attacks. So that is you know, very similar to some of the stuff that, that happened in Afghanistan. So our interest was peaked and we started to look at you know, at, at cases and at driving forces and at organizations and networks uh, and, and asked ourselves, how, how can we find these people? How can, we, how can we find out what they are up to? So that was our one entry point. The other entry point that we always had in the back of our mind was of course that we knew that a lot of far-right extremist terrorist perpetrators have been referencing each other across countries and across continents. Um, so, you know, you're all aware of the terrorist attack in Christchurch, for example, against uh, two mosques. Uh, and the perpetrator of those attacks referenced Anders Bering Breivik in Norway, who had attacked Muslims. There was a case uh, in Germany uh, where a far right a terrorist attacked a Jewish synagogue and killed um, a Turkish migrant worker. Uh, in Germany, and he also referenced the Christchurch attacker. And then there have been terrorist cases in the United States where they referenced all three of them or two of them. So, you know, this was our second entry point that we knew that um, in, this, in this whole realm of 
lone shooter terrorists on the far right, there's an ideological connection that ties them all together. So those were the two avenues that we started to, started to follow. So one of our first questions was, again, which organizations are instrumental in you know, making it easy for neo-Nazis, for far-right extremists to network? And one of the groups that we identified very early was the Russian imperial movement. Um, and the Russian imperial movement is an organization that has been around for quite a while, and they can be described as ultra-Orthodox in the Christian Orthodox sense, as ultra-nationalist in a Russian sense, um, as white supremacists in the global sense. Um, and this organization is important. It's based in St. Petersburg. It's important because the Russian state is not interested in curbing them in any way whatsoever. So they're basically free to do whatever they want. And they are important also because they're very much hands-on. So in St. Petersburg, uh, we found out that they run a paramilitary training camp where you can book courses um, and you know, basically be trained as if you were a soldier. And um, a lot of the training that you can get there is the kind of training that is forbidden in most of you know, the rest of Europe, even, well, I'm not sure about the United States, but I would think in many, many other countries too, because they get to use you know, weapons that you can't possibly get your hands on in most parts of Western Europe. Um, you're being trained by actual veterans of wars, by actual Russian soldiers who have been in wars, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very serious thing. And we started to look into this and we realized there have been far-right extremists from all over Europe and all over the West who have gone there to train with the Russian imperial movement. Um, and the Russian imperial movement had also dispatched a couple of their own fighters to fight in Ukraine on the Russian side in 2014 and 15. So there was a very real connection there to actual warfare and the battlefield. And when we looked at, you know, who are the guys who are going there, we discovered right-wing extremists from Sweden, from Italy, from the Balkans, from Germany. Um, so all sorts of people who went there for training. We also uh, realized that um, there was a connection between the Russian imperial movement and far-right extremist groups in the United States of America. And that really surprised us because you know, we were not aware of that. Um, and uh, the, on, the, on the United States end uh, of the story, we found Matthew Heinbach, who um, used to be a very important leader in the neo-Nazi movement in the United States. And he had actually invited um, a delegation of the Russian imperial movement to the United States a couple of years prior. Um, and there was footage of that and there were pictures of that. And so we contacted both. We contacted the Russian imperial movement and we contacted Matthew Heinbach. And you know, we were able to speak to both of them. So one of our reporters met Heinbach in Tennessee in the United States. And another of our reporters met the head of the military or paramilitary training unit of the Russian imperial movement in Russia. And we spoke to both of them length in, you know, for quite some time about what is it that they believe and why is it important for them to connect? And this is when we got our first sense of the ideological underpinning that is absolutely vital for the kind of globalization that we are describing in our article, namely that these people believe there's a global fight in which, it, like a global, like a, um, we, you could describe it as a global civil war. This is how they look at the world. They believe that there's a global civil war going on between the right and the left. And the right in that case is, you know, white people, people who share their beliefs. And the other side is, you know, everybody who's not white, um, Jews, homosexuals, um, liberals, you know, you name it. So, you know, both sides are not, uh, you know, they are not um, distinguished as clearly as you would sometimes think that neo-Nazis see the world. But on the other hand, there's a global, a sense of global unity between these people who identify with, you know, one side of this conflict. And so we, we learned, you know, through these interviews that, you know, 
the times where the far right was basically a nationalist enterprise are over. Nation, borders of nations, state borders don't matter anymore. Um, so, you know, when 10 years ago or 15 years ago, a Polish neo-Nazi and a German neo-Nazi would probably hit each other over the head because the one is a German nationalist and the other one is a Polish nationalist. Now, in these new times, they would probably start to form an alliance because they got a common enemy on a global scale. And this, is, this was the key for us to understand these kinds of networks. So, you know, starting from, from, from this, we would then looked into all kinds of other organizations and realized that it's, you know, wherever you look, this is really happening. This is what's going on. So just to give you an idea of the other kinds of alliances or networks that we came across. One is, for example, the whole nexus between originally American neo-Nazi organizations like Atomwaffendivision um, and the Siege Network and an organization called The Base. Um, they were originally uh, American organizations who've all started to branch out and they actually have affiliate groups um, in, you know, places in, in the case of the base in places as far away as the Netherlands, Germany, um, the Baltic states, Scandinavia, Australia, um, South Africa. So this is a truly a global network. It's not a huge organization. We're only talking about, you know, a couple of dozens, maybe a hundred operatives. But these are, you know, these are people who are highly militant, who I would actually call, you know, wannabe terrorists in waiting. And, and they, have, they have formed global networks based on the idea that I have outlined before that, you know, there's a global civil war going on and, and they need to prepare, they need to fight back against what they perceive as an onslaught of liberals, Jews, homosexuals, and you know, you name it. Um, so in the process of this, uh, I, I'm sorry, and I should mention one other network because it's very um, instrumental as well. And because it also puts another highlight on the importance of, of, of the conflict in Ukraine. Um, I mentioned that the Russian imperialist movement was fighting on the Russian side, but there were many neo-Nazis fighting on the Ukrainian side as well. Um, and um, they, they were organized, um, or they were drawn to the conflict by the Azov network, which is a political network that grew out of the original Azov Battalion, of which you probably have heard a lot in the news recently because they are the last defenders of the city of Mariupol in Ukraine today. Um, but then back in the day in 2014, that was a very right-wing organization and they you know, organized a, a political organization grew out of them. And this political organization was recruiting fighters actively for the war in Ukraine for a long, long time. So we identified one of their female recruiters who went to Germany at least seven times that we know of, where she actively recruited people for the cause to come to Ukraine. Um, and in Germany, we identified um, one young German neo-Nazi who wanted to fight in Ukraine. And in order to be allowed to go there, did all sorts of jobs for this Ukrainian network in Germany. Among his jobs you know, was um, international networking. So wherever we look, we found that this is happening and, and there are examples for that and people are doing it while we are looking at them. Um, so yeah, so you know what we did was then, and I'm just going to talk very briefly about methods because you know I've already mentioned interviews, but there were quite a few court cases that we followed because we had heard or you know we had we were hoping to see more about international connections in these particular court cases. And in many cases, um, we actually did come across these international connections. So there was a court case in the Netherlands, for example, where two neo-Nazis um, were put on trial also because they had connections to um, the US-based network, The Base. Um, we found out in a German court case how um, about how one young German neo-Nazi was radicalized on the internet and tried to get recruited into Atomwaffendivision. We were able to describe how um, another German guy um, made his way not only online into the base, but actually traveled to the United States to train with these neo-Nazis in the United States. Um, 
so court cases, visiting court cases, going through the documents was also very instrumental in, 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 in this case. Uh, another thing that we did and we you know, needed, needed to do uh, was, um, had to do with data mining um, because we managed to get our hands on a pretty giant leak of internal, um, internal chats from um, Atomwaffendivision uh, in the United States. And we digitalized all of that and made it searchable um, and you know, combed through it with a very, very fine comb to find traces of internal, in, sorry, uh, international connections there. And we found connections to Germany. Um, so data mining, also very important. Um, and one other thing that was instrumental in one particularly interesting aspect, the case of the young German guy who worked on behalf of Ukrainian neo-Nazis and helped them recruit. And um, that, you know, that protagonist of our story, we could only identify and interview because one of my colleagues very, very, um, you know, very diligently and for weeks on end, um, tried to track the boy down through social media Invest through a social media investigation. Um, and once he had identified him, of course, it was very, very important to you know, get him to talk to us. Um, and that brings me to the point of, of safety, lastly, um, because when you meet with these people, um, you, of course, you have no guarantee what's going to happen. So you know, when my colleague Christian Fuchs met with this German neo-Nazi who had worked with the Ukrainian neo-Nazis, um, that boy insisted or young men insisted that they, you know, go for a walk in the mountains alone. And that, of course, presented a bit of a security challenge because, you know, we wanted to make sure our reporter was safe. And so we had a security protocol um, in, in place. And, you know, he checked in every, I think, every 30 minutes. And he, he sent us a signal that he was OK. Um, and so, you know, fortunately, all went well. Um, yeah, so, you know, and when we tied it all together, I think, I think that we actually could, you know, fill some of these theories that we had developed along the way, we could fill them with actual examples from the real world of, you know, actual people who did the networking hands on, um, and we were able to, you know, reconstruct the way they did it. So I, I do think that our investigation helped the understanding of these processes along. Um, but that, of course, is for the reader to judge. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and hope that I've you know, painted a bit of a picture of, of how we went about it. Um, thank you very much um, for that. And I think um, it's, a lot, it's a lot to take in. And uh, I'm going to start this um, dialogue um, with um, where um, Ali Afridi mentioned, which is trying to connect um, the origin of uh, far-right extremism. So, when there are many schools of thought, when there are many parts uh, to, this, um, to this issue, you, uh, journalists are not researchers. And um, the way journalists would operate would be largely limited to the resources and the information within them. But unlike other issues, um, this issue of uh, extremism seems to be really, really critical. And uh, any attempt to focus on what you are only having access to may seem to be um, ignoring the fuller picture. So how do you try as much as possible to ensure balance in your reporting and uh, mm. ensuring you have fair access to everyone, even though you are limited by access. Yes, I mean that is a that is a problem that I'm well aware of. You know, because I've been covering terrorism for quite a long time, and it's you know there's always the question of who do you who can you believe, who can you trust, who's trying to tell you lies, and you know who's neutral in in all of this and. Um, of course, I mean, you know, when we enter into an investigation like this, and I mean, I should mention that, you know, very, very luckily, we at the time have at our disposal, you know, a large team. I mean, there was, I think, six people from inside the site plus three 
um, uh, independent um, reporters that we um, that we hired um, to do for certain tasks. So we're quite a large group of people. But when we enter into an, in, an investigation like this, the first thing we do is we all read a ton. You know, we, we all read a lot of background material, we read academic studies, we talk to experts. So we, we try to, you know, build a basis of knowledge on which we then build. Because the particular case that will become part of your story is, is uh, it is only possible to understand this case, you know, after you've built an, uh, a basis of, of, of understanding of the problem as such. And, and I think, I mean, I believe that if, if you read if you spend two weeks reading academic articles and 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 reports by expert methods on the issue, you have a pretty good understanding of what the mainstream is, what the you know what the fundamental interpretation of the problem is. Um, so so then you are somewhat competent, I think, um, to you know to understand what it is that you are then looking at. Um, and. Um, when you meet with, I mean, when you interview people like a neo-Nazi, of course you have to take everything with a grain of salt. You know, of course you have to try and 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 verify everything he tells you. Of course you have to, you know, always be aware of the fact that he is a party in this, and you know his job is not to give the best and, and you know complete information to reporters. Um, but but that can't let you, you know, not, that can't be a reason not to talk to them. You still have to talk to them. And then you have to take whatever they tell you and try to check it, try to see if it all checks out, you know, try to find the second source. And if you can't find the second source, which, you know, quite often is the case, you have to signal that in your text. You have to say, this is what he said, we, you know, we can't corroborate that. But it makes sense because there's another case where it was similar, or, you know, you have to somehow, you know, establish some some frame of reference because you don't want to be gullible you have to make sure that you just you can't just put in your paper one on one what people tell you you know that that's that's never possible um you shouldn't do that of course so verification is always a big um, part of the part, part of the job uh, and we spend quite some time with that yeah, thank you. So regarding um anytime this issue of far right extremism and uh uh, ways of thinking comes up and um, the way it is presented as something that is really really serious especially the language of extremism makes me really wonder how comfortable a journalist can be uh, to be able to really approach these kinds of interviews and still yeah. be able to feel safe but anytime i think that is not possible my mind goes to this really really interesting guy uh jordan klepper who's really uh who is able to who has been able to know how to not just interview uh some fur rights opinionists but he's also actually able to get some them to laugh and get jokes out of mm -hmm. them and still be able to present their ways uh, their views I really wish I can share the audios of this. Really, one of the interviews I think uh, shows how people can actually go, and um, it's really, really. Let me know if you, your audio is. Can you hear the video? No, I, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't hear it. Oh, it's really, really. Uh, it's really, really fascinating how people that you know they are. Yeah. The, what they are saying is really, really, they see the media as a threat, but still yeah, are yeah. still comfortable to talk to you. It still means there is a, some level of trust that they have in the person that makes the person to feel safe and for them to still be willing to talk to you. How do you achieve that? Well, there's, um, that's a very good question. And I think I have a, at least a bit of an answer to that. And this is basically drawn from my experience in covering jihadists, but it's the same problem. I think that these extremists generally are willing to talk to you if you, if they can tell that you are actually interested and that you have done your homework before talking to them. So, you know, when I talk to a jihadist and he can see that I have read his books, 
he will talk to me very differently. Um, and it's the same experience that we had, uh, you know, interviewing James Mason, for example, in the United States, who's somewhat, you know, he's like the godfather of neo-Nazis in the United States. And, you know, his writings are responsible for, the, you know, the globalization of his ideology. And, and when our reporter went there, I mean, he basically knocked on his door and said, I'm a reporter, can I talk to you? There's stuff we want to understand. Help us understand it because you've written these books. Is this what you wanted? And, you know, so, you know, if, but he knew that we were serious about this. You know, we, we did our homework. Um, and, and I think this is, um, it's, you know, I, I don't do this to make, you know, neo-Nazis feel good. Personally, I don't care about them. You know, I despise them. But as a journalist, I think it is a question of self-respect that I need to be prepared for any interview that I do, even if it's with a nice guy that I like, you know. So, and, and, and you know, extremists people, extremists understand this too. They will know if you're serious or not. They will, and, 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 and the more serious they believe you are, the more they will trust you not to bend their words when you write your article, you know? So I think this is, this is part of the recipe. That's very important for me anyway. I always tell my people, we always tell each other, never go into an interview like that unprepared. You have to know what the guy has said. You have to know what he's read, what, what, what he's written, ideally also what he's read. Yeah, thank you. I think I've been able to fix. Um, we have lots of questions, so I'm really happy you did not sure. go along with you. But I really want to also get us in the minds of those that are on the forefront. Now, um, racism is still one of the ideal issues of extremism. And some time ago, I saw this uh, report on Inside America's Last Only White Church. And um, it... like an average religious gathering, but this is no ordinary church service. This is the Astro Truth Folk Assembly, known simply as the AFA, a fringe heathen group that mandates their members have Northern European heritage, a whites only church in 21st century America. They represent a disturbing trend in contemporary white nationalism, the co-opting of heathen symbols and myths to promote racial purity and fears of a white genocide. We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. I'm on a journey to understand how this group is gaining influence across the country. So the requirements to be part of the As True Folk Assembly, you do have to be of Native European descent. You know, they say they're good people. So I'm going to take their word for it. And to meet the anti-racist heathens who are fighting to reclaim their religion from extremists. I'm doing everything that I now, why am I really about this? Does it really matter if, or that seems, this is not just a force of this kind of video that I will watch, and uh, the journalists that will do the report could actually be one of the individuals that um, those kinds of settings are against. In this case, we have a black female journalist going mm. into what seems to be America's last only white um, church. Um, is that okay? And um, if we want to look at it, whether those that issue is actually at the focus or it directly affects that particular journalist, does it risk of safety or exploitation? And is it normal? And does it add any color to that kinds of uh, reporting? Well, I, I mean, I obviously I find it very difficult to comment on, on on an excerpt of you know I haven't seen the whole thing and I don't know anything about that colleague. So, but generally speaking, I'd look at this from a purely professional perspective, or I try to. Um, so we are journalists, far and foremost. This is our first, um, our first identity, I think, uh, in 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 and in, in approaching any subject. I don't think it should make a difference who you are, personally. Um, it can be an advantage and it can be a disadvantage sometimes but i tell you what i come from a very weird background you know i'm half arab which i don't look but i got an arabic name and also i come from a christian arabic family but my name is muslim 
So I confuse people all the time. You know, I'm used to this. And, you know, I've seen the advantages. I've seen the disadvantages. But I've also seen when I thought what would be an advantage turned into a disadvantage and the other way around. So, you know, I, I try to, I think the safest thing is to look at this as a professional issue and not play on what, you know, you, some people would think are, pro, uh, you know, advantages or disadvantages. Um, there are tactical, there are tactical moves, of course. And in, 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 I mean, to be quite honest, in an, in, an, in an investigation like the one that I've described, for example, when we approached the Russian imperial movement in Russia, we were, it was quite clear that it, this, it would probably be difficult for one of us not speaking Russian to show up there and, you know, get a good interview um, with a translator. I mean, this, you know, it's, it's, you know, it could still work, but we decided to rely on the services of a Russian colleague, you know, and said, we, we, we contacted him, we knew he was a trustworthy colleague, and we contacted him and said, do you think you can get there? Do you think you can get this interview and do it for us? And, you know, so he called around and spoke to a few people and he said, yes, I can get the interview. What do you want to know? So I sat down with him and we discussed, you know, what we want. And I gave him, I think, 40 or 50 questions. And, and he did the interview for us. And that worked quite, quite nicely. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, I don't, I personally don't waste too much time on who, oh, okay. who of the reporters has what particular background. So yeah, yeah, I hope this answers your question. <laughs> okay, yeah, very good. So which simply means for a journalist that are thinking probably there are some restrictions. Uh, I think uh, from what uh, Yasin has said, um, it's not really about um, probably you as a journalist. It's about the story and your ability to deliver um, what is expected. Do I paraphrase that really well? Um yeah i suppose <laughs> well I, I i would just put it different i mean i've seen you know i've seen you know one of my favorite colleagues in the world is a female arab journalist who does badass reporting in jihadist circles even yeah. though most people are like how can she do that she's a woman well she can i don't know how but she can <laughs> i love that <laughs> yeah and that's what i'm interested in you know yeah okay so i think i've since i've sorted out the voice the voice thing so i will go back to that video i wanted to show you to show you how comfortable uh this guy he is when he's actually interviewing people that has all these yeah. alternative perspectives on this so been to a trump rally before no sir what are your expectations truth truth at a trump rally yeah good luck <laughs> Barack Obama had a big part of 9-11. Which part? Not being around, always on vacation, never in the office. Why do you think Barack Obama wasn't in the Oval Office on 9-11? That I don't know. We'd like to get to the bottom. The way he's able to keep a straight face, not just that, um, they still trust him to still be able to communicate. I think is something that is really, really worthy. So let's go to... So uh, the point for, from all our conversation is really, really, it's still journalism. You still have to be able to get your facts right. You still have to be able to do your research, like, like Yasin has said. You have to be able to be intentional and still be a journalist, even though this is a very sensitive topic. So the first question I would like to take, I think it's probably from Facebook, is this, um, where is the balance between reporting on extremists, i.e. getting their right to respond, and the danger of sharing their point of views more widely? Ah, okay. Well, again, uh, so fascinating for me, <laughs> because many, many of the problems that come up are discussion points that, that I have experienced covering jihadism in the past already. Um, well, I think as journalists, we have an obligation to the public. Um, and this obligation, obligation is that we have to allow the public to reach a state where they can form opinions and take decisions for themselves. We don't take it for them. They need to know what's happening in the world. We are telling them as best we can. But we are not the ones censoring them. I don't do that. Um, I think that 
there's a bigger danger not writing about things um, because they could, you know, because that way I'm spreading a message um, as opposed to not writing about it. I think not writing about it, trying to keep it a secret, trying to keep it under the blanket is the bigger secret. And it's also, I can't reconcile that with my job. If it's news, it's news, and I'm going to report about it. And um, the question is always, how do I report about it? Do I do it professionally? And I think that, I mean, I have been writing about extremists for a long time, and I don't think anybody would ever, you know, look at my articles and say, you helped Al-Qaeda or you helped ISIS or you helped Nazis because I wrote about what they believe. No, it is possible to write about what these people believe without you know, that helping them get recruits. Quite the opposite. It helps raise awareness of how big the problem is. It helps raise awareness of how easy it is for them to recruit other people if you don't know their arguments. So I think that we have a role there. And um, as a journalist, Again, this is back to professionalism. If it's news, I'm going to report it, but I'm going to do it well if I can, you know. And yeah. um, and that's that's all the difference, I think. Yeah. Okay. Let's also go to the issue of um. Let's go back to the issue of safety. Uh, is a recurring yeah. uh, rhetoric. Kind of. So, what are your tips on safety when doing these kinds of reporting? Did you yeah. at any point worry about your reporters being attacked or threatened? And you can also share insights for. Or more mm. experiences that you're aware of? Um, in all honesty, I have to say that in this particular investigation, I think the, 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 there were three points where I, where I was a little concerned. One was um, um, the interview I already talked about when my colleague Christian Fuchs met with this uh, guy with the Ukrainian connection and he insisted on going for a walk. And um, my colleague is a very, very experienced reporter. He's been covering neo-Nazis for a long, long time. And before he asked for the interview, he had spoken with lots of people from his family, former friends. So he had a pretty good idea of the personality of the guy. Um, and he had already spoken to him on the phone, I think, several times before they agreed to meet in person. So I asked him, I said, do you feel, do you feel okay with this? Do you want to do this? And he said, yes, I'm, I, I don't have problems at all. Uh, I, I'm very happy to do it. I don't think anything's going to happen. Because, and I should, I should have said that before, but I need to clarify that now. Because this particular young person said to us, and we believe now, a year later, that it is actually true, that he's in the process of de-radicalizing. So he was not interested in going to Ukraine anymore as a fighter. He wanted to leave radicalism behind. This is what he told us, and Christian believed him that he was, you know, now these processes take a time. Just because somebody says that doesn't mean it's true or, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. But we had reason to believe that, that he was probably actually trying to make us understand what happened. Um, so again, we had a security protocol, and this is what happens a lot of times. You, you know, you make sure you always know where your reporter is. You always, you know, you 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 agree on a certain um, pattern of notification. In this case, I think, like I said, every thirty minutes, I wanted a, a, a text message by my friend. Um, there's a code word in place if anything goes, um, you know, anything becomes problematic. And the, the the guy on the other hand of the security protocol always also knows where the next police station is, just in case. So this is what we, um, you know, had in place. Uh, in that particular situation. The other two situations were the interview in Russia with the head of the Russian imperialist movement. But in that case, the Russian colleague said he was very confident also because the guy is basically running uh, a business. So he's not interested in you know, murdering somebody on his own premises. That probably wouldn't look too good. Um, and then James Mason, um, the interview with James Mason, the godfather of, of American neo-Nazism uh, in Denver, um, you know, with no prior appointment but in this case the guy who did the interview was my boss so I was fine with that <laughs> you know he, he's uh, he's more experienced than I am and so that was cool um, so there are other cases um, you know of course where you have to be very careful and we I mean this colleague that I already mentioned Christian Fuchs he's knocked on so many doors of neo-nazi terrorists I, you know I don't even know how many um, but he usually takes somebody along. So at least we try to be two people at, at any given moment. 
Um, and again, security protocol is always in place in cases like that. Um, so, and we always, our first rule is don't take unnecessary risks. So if you feel that this could escalate, if you feel that there's danger, if you, for example, if you see that the guy's drunk, come back the next day, you know, um, don't, don't force your way in if you feel, if you feel unsafe. So we try to minimize the risk. Um, okay. Of course, we are still being threatened. We are being sued and all of that. And, you know, other people have bigger problems than us, but it happens to us too. But, and this is going to be the last thing um, I say about this on this regard, but it's important, I think, that real journalism will never be 100% risk-free. Hmm. Um, so, so we are willing to accept that, you know, there is a hopefully very slow um, a, a very sorry, very low percentage of, of risk involved in the job that we do, but it is there, and you know we accept that because these are not nice people. Personally, do you think uh, freelance journalists can thrive um, in this line of reporting? Well, about freelance journalists, I mean there are excellent, excellent investigative freelance journalists around and extremism experts around um, in, in journalism. But I have to say, I enjoy working in large teams, and it's a privilege. I know that. I understand that. Um, we have very often, on in many occasions, worked together with freelance reporters. You know, for a while, um, for a particular investigation, and that I have very good experiences with that um, sort of agreement. Yeah. But I know it's very hard to do this work by your own on on your own and to get paid for it in a way that actually makes makes it worth you know because investigations of this kind take a long time so who's going to i mean if you get paid for an article but you've worked for months on the story you're not going to be able to live on that so you know i i, I have the deepest yeah. respect for independent journalists who do this kind of reporting um from my experience i'd say tr if, if you're interested try to approach large newsrooms for a cooperation maybe that suits your purposes better sometimes and helps both sides Okay, we have a question from Elizabeth Thompson, uh, who is joining us from Ottawa in Canada. So, uh, Elizabeth writes, did you also monitor social media groups on platforms like Telegram? Are there particular ones where they come together? Yes, we did, um, we, we did look into Telegram chats and, and Telegram channels, um, also other media, uh, other social media platforms that play a role in this regard. Um, there are certain places where they hang out. These places change all the time, and it's very difficult to, to keep track of that. Um, my colleague Astrid, um, she was instrumental in, in covering that part of our investigation. Um, if you want to get in touch with her, I, I can I can organize that. But I, I can't, and I won't name off the top of my head now. You know, um, Atomwaffen Division Telegram channels. That that I don't think that makes sense. But yes these channels do exist. Yeah, then um, in terms of um, journalists being able to comprehensively report on these issues, uh, what do you still, where do you still think uh, journalists are still lagging behind and still struggling to play catch up? Sorry, where, where, where do journalists struggle? In to? which aspect do you still think uh, journalists are still yeah. lagging behind in being able ah. to keep up with these uh, such that they are trying to play catch up? Yeah, I think, hmm, it's a very good question. Um, I think there has, been, well, actually, I think it's actually almost more a question of quantity than of quality. I think there's been excellent reporting on far-right extremism um, across the board. I mean, look at the, look at the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, reportage of the Washington Post about January 6th in the United States. It was excellent reporting. And there's excellent reporting in a number of countries on this. Um, I think it's uh, it's not enough. Um, I think you know um, there's always certain dynamics. Um, for 15 years, for 10 years, nobody wanted to hear extremism stories about anything other than Islamic Islamist terrorism. Now, um, and completely rightly, people are more you know looking more at, at right wing extremism because you know look at what happened in the United States in the last week alone, and these people kill all the time you know, 
uh, they're dangerous and we need more reporting about that. And I think the reporting that we have is mostly good. We probably just need more about it. Yeah, I agree with you. Probably these will be the two last questions. The first question mm -hmm. is, is that a lot of these groups are finding transnational alliances uh, via the internet, which is helpful for journalists and law enforcement investigating and in these groups. Do you believe governments of corporate policies monitoring and censoring these groups are putting any dent to stopping them? Mm. Ah, that's a, that's a very interesting debate. Again, a debate that I know from jihadism as well. You know, if you shut down all the groups, will you will you end the problem? I don't think you will. I don't think you will. I don't think you can. Um, I think it's very important to have a, have a good eye to monitor. You know, to have a good eye on these on these chat rooms and and forums and billboards. I think it's important to 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 monitor them. But I think. It is important for journalists to do this as well, and not only for security institutions. I don't like to do the job of security institutions. They have a purpose. Our job is to control them. You know, we can't rely on them to help us in our reporting. Um, we have to do this ourselves. Um, do I wish it was more difficult for these people to connect on the internet? Yes, but I also know that if they want to connect, they're going to find ways. And they, they will be meeting online in places that I cannot find, you know, so I prefer them to meet in places that I can find for the time being. Okay. Um, this question also came in. Uh, how do you report on groups like the Taliban that their ideology is based on their ethnicity and religion uh, such that uh, you will not be standing against their ethnicity? Sorry, the last bit I didn't get. The... As such that you will not be standing against their ethnicity. Okay, so how, how do I report about groups like the Taliban? Yes, what are you advising? How do you, how do journalists report on groups like Taliban that their ideology is based on their ethnicity and religion, such that uh, it will not appear as if your reporting is attacking their ethnicity? So if I report, sorry, I don't get the question. If I report about them, I will further their cause or, or I will have a problem as a reporter. No, the question is this, probably to be as safe, so that it will not be as safe you are attacking their race and not just what they are doing. I think that if the person is talking about drawing the lines between um, uh, reporting on what a group like Taliban is doing and the part yeah. so that it's not associated with the part of the world where the the group is majorly located. Okay, I'm I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but what I think I think is important, and I hope this helps in, in the answering. Um, Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm reading this. He suggested the Taliban's ideology is based on their ethnicity. Well, there's a big overlap between the Taliban's ideology and a certain ethnicity. I mean, that's true for many groups in many, in many places of the earth. Um, and if I report about them, and um, that's part of the story, obviously, you know, and I think, I don't think, so generally speaking, very broadly, very generally speaking, this is a complicated world in which we live. But as journalists, we cannot never ever be afraid of complexity. Complexity is there for us to break down as, as good as we can do it, as well as we can do it. So, you know, we can never run away from anything because it's a complicated story. The Taliban is a complicated story. So it needs to be a long story that you write about them, it needs to be well-researched. You need to talk to lots of people and then you have to write it very well, but it can be done. Um, so very generally speaking, I think, I think that's, that's what my answer would be. You know, if you do your work diligently and professionally, it, it almost always solves many of these problems. Um, you know, do I further their cause? Do I emanate their propaganda? Do I do their work for them? No, no, and no. If you, you know, there are ways, there are professional ways to write about extremism without, without it turning into propaganda. Yes, and um, as we wrap up, uh, what do you think uh, the take-home message for today should be uh, for journalists uh, that are on the call today? I think I would hope that the takeaway message is that if <laughs> I don't want this to sound too pathetic or too cheesy, but you know, if they collaborate across borders, we should do it as well. We should do it better. 
Um, you know, we are, we are journalists, we speak the same professional language. Um, if the problem is a global problem, um, our answer should be a global investigation whenever that's possible. So, you know, if it's, it's great if you do this on your own. Um, it's probably better if we all work together. So that would be my takeaway message. Yes, so um, thank you very much. And uh, we are really glad that you can join us. Then um, in case you're on this call and you would like to get any further, get in contact with Yasin or get any kind of support regarding I'll, this. I'll write, my, I'll write my email please. address into the, into yes, the chat. Please. Uh, yes, please uh, put it there. And um, I've also, I will also put mine there so that we can further help you in whatever you are doing and that uh, we can guide you and uh, ensure that uh, you're able to get um, going. And uh, this is an ongoing conversation that we, that is unending and uh, we hope that it, uh, this session has inspired you uh, to be able to do that. And um, we would like to hear more from you regarding um, this issue and other issues. I uh, would also like to know how we've, how our uh, programming has impacted your reporting in one way or the other. So we have a survey uh, that we are currently uh, conducting through which you can actually get your opinions across to us and uh, we can also put this into consideration uh, in designing our further programs. And uh, I've just, if you, look, if you look at the chat box, I've put a link there that takes you to a quick survey. Please and please, before you go, click on the link. Uh, let us know your opinions on these issues and we'll be glad. And if you'd like to know more about the ICFJ's uh, Global Crisis Reporting Forum, please visit www.icfj.org and um, you'll know more about us. If you also, we also encourage you uh, to be part of our Facebook community where we share resources and insights and uh, other information uh, we think that will be really, really important. We are on Facebook and I would like you to be part of our world. Instead of searching, I've put the link directly in the chat box. Uh, you can be part of our Facebook community and uh, we'll be happy that you, you, are, you are able to ask, uh, be part of us. And we also have a lot of resources for you via the Hygienet initiative. So please visit Hygienet's website on www.hygienet.org. Uh, Once again, I really want wanted to help get across to us regarding uh, that survey. It's really, really important. It's what we do to really improve our offerings, how you get back to us, and we are glad that you've been there. So thank you very much, Yasin. Uh, thank you very much, everyone that is on this call. And from me and the entire CRJ team, we say have a great day and bye for now. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me.